Okay, so a lot of people have asked me for a little bit of advice on how to prepare for your SATs or your PSATs. So I wanted to try to walk you through some of the most common places where you can up your score and earn yourself some more points. So for today's tutorial, I'm going to be using the College Board's SAT, which you can get from this particular website here. Um, I also have some screenshots up there to help you, but it might be easier if you do download the pieces from the SAT College Board. All right, so the first and the easiest section for most people to earn their points is the vocabulary section. So there's two different types of vocabulary questions, the single blanks and the double blanks. Generally, the best tip is to replace the blank with the word that you think you should be using, and then you can look for synonyms, and that'll help you rule out some antonyms. The general rule for the PSAT and the SAT is that if you can rule out some answers, if you can narrow it down, go ahead and make a guess. You lose a quarter of a point for wrong answers. You don't get any point deductions for uh, questions you omit. But again, if you can rule it out, the possibility of gaining some points far outweighs the consequences of getting them wrong. So keep in mind that if you haven't ever seen some of the words that are on there, you can always look for prefixes and suffixes. So some of the more common, the first one that they are going to ask you is going to be a relatively easy question. So it says many private universities depend heavily on blank and when wealthy individuals who support them with gifts and bequests. So again, the prefix here, Benny means good. So benefactor would be the right answer for this one. So just knowing some of the prefixes and suffixes will help you to do well on this particular piece. Also look for context clues as well. Oftentimes they're gonna give you a definition within the word itself. Um, so one of the characters in Milton Maruyama's novel is considered blank because he deliberately defies an oppressive hierarchical society. So to deliberately defy something would be to be a rebellious. So you can try the final ones on your own, but as you go through, just keep in mind that some of these prefixes will help you um, in order to make an educated guess. And with the ones that have two blanks, again, you can look for synonyms and rule out the ones that you know, for example, are antonyms. So if you don't know certain words, for example, perhaps you might know the, uh, the opposite of it. And that'll help you to kind of rule some of those out. Okay. So here is the example, right? And if you take a look, for example, at uh, question number five, it says the range of colors that homeowners could use on the exterior of their houses was blanked by the community's stringent rules regarding upkeep of property. So we know we want something that means governed, right? So some of these are on the PSAT word list that I've given many of you. So again, we know embellish means to add or decorate it, so that wouldn't work. Many of you guys know the word cultivate already, um, and bolster means to prop up. So we're left with these two, and circum, again, means around, and scribed means to be written down. So just by process of elimination, we can figure out that this one is circumscribed, which means written down or regulated. So again, those root words, synonyms, antonyms, will be very helpful to you in this section to try to figure out what the proper and correct answer is. Let's take a look at one more just to make sure that we understand. Uh, night jars uh, possess a camouflage, perhaps unparalleled in the bird world. By day they roost hidden in shady woods, so blank, so blended, or so uh, in tune with their surroundings that they are nearly impossible to see. So again, we can, from those particular ones, start ruling ones out. So there's some that we could probably figure out already or not the correct answer. Um, obviously, interrupt would not be uh, an answer there. Um, blended was one of the words that we used as a synonym. Um, impossible to discern means to see. So the answer to this one would be B. And finally, number four, uh, many economists believe since resources are scarce and since human desires cannot all be blanked, a method of 
is needed. So since human desires cannot all be regulated, some kind of method of doing that regulation is needed. Um, so when we look at this, we know that indulged probably um, is a good one since all human desires can't be indulged. A me method of apportionment or putting allotting aside things might be needed. Um, we can probably get rid of words like anticipated and advertising, um, expressed, um, verified. And so you can narrow it down and figure it out even if you didn't know that apportionment means like an allotment of something. And so A is the correct one for that particular piece. When we move to the next session, which is the critical reading, there's a number of different types of passages that you are going to see. The first are the short passages, where they give you short independent passages to analyze. These are again are a good place for quick points as long as you read and read carefully. The second piece that you might get are comparative passages that are short, where they ask you to put passage one and passage two together and then make comments about what passage one and passage two might either agree on or disagree about. Comparative passages that are lengthy, the long passages, are probably the most difficult section of the critical reading. As the name suggests, they're going to give you some long passages to read and put the two of them in conversation. The final type of passage that you'll get on the critical reading section is a prose passage. So a piece from like a fictional work or perhaps a piece of nonfiction to read. Um, and again, just like you would in an English class, you're going to be asked questions about character, character development, vocabulary, and theme. Prose is generally one of the easier sections in which to score points simply because it's a familiar kind of reading, whereas the other ones are much more clinical. They are going to give you very boring passages, so be prepared. The two places where people generally have the worst uh, kind of attention span are in history and in science. So the passages tend to be drawn from those two particular fields simply because they know that that's where people struggle. It also requires some specialized vocabulary. And again, don't let that throw you. If you don't know a name, simply skip over it. Use your context clues. Don't necessarily let yourself be flummoxed by words that you don't know. The biggest thing you can do in the critical reading passage to open up your score and to really make it shine is to make sure you read. And that might seem like a duh, Dr. Miller moment. But again, you want to make sure that you are reading and comprehending the material. So pause and read slowly as you go through and constantly ask yourself the following questions, which I'll refer to throughout this as the acronym PSAA. What is the purpose of the passage? Is it to inform? Is it to explain? What is it doing? Is it arguing a particular point? What's the purpose? What's the structure? Do they give the thesis first and then give support to it afterwards? Or does it take them a little bit of time to get to their thesis? Do they give a point counterpoint? What's the structure of this argument? What is the argument? If you had to give a thesis, what would it be? And then finally, what is the attitude of the speaker or the writer? What's their tone? Are they angry about something? Uh, are they simply matter of fact? What is the tone or the attitude of the speaker? By simply thinking about those things as you read the passage, you're going to bolster your score. Now, we're going to do a couple of sample critical reading passages, and I'm going to model for you what I do when I read. Now, people oftentimes ask the question, do you really have enough time to do this? And the answer is yes, you don't have enough time not to do this. Because if you don't read closely, you're going to end up having to go back and reread. And the rereading and the rereading again is something that's going to take up more of your valuable time. So again, make sure you read, make sure you pause slowly, and constantly go through that PSAA method. You'll notice when you look at some of the questions on this section, uh, the primary purpose of passage one, the purpose of passage two is, what would passage one theme say about passage two theme? Um, what is the purpose of passage one, unlike passage two? Those are the kinds of questions that you can anticipate, and these particular PSAA uh, pieces will help you interpret and get to the right answer. Okay, so again, 
This sounds dumb, but make sure that you're reading the piece, stop every sentence or so, and explain what's going on or paraphrase what's being said. And the PSAT and the SAT both bank on people skimming, not reading, getting bored, getting distracted, or reading only the questions and avoiding reading. You must read while you do it, okay? So don't get deterred by the subject matter. Make sure you read, summarize, and practice that PSAA method. So let's try it with the two short passages. So in the two short passages, they're going to ask you, again, a few questions following it. Keep in mind that we're going to stop periodically, and this is what you should be training yourself to do when you take the SAT or PSAT. I know what your email inbox looks like, and it isn't pretty. A babble of come-ons and lies from hucksters and con artists. Okay, so very informal introduction here using the I pronoun and again says they know exactly what your email inbox looks like and they appeal to you by saying that it is full of lies from con artists, like all of those awful spam pieces of email that we get that tell us that we have inherited a fortune from some long lost relative, all right? To find your real email, you must wade through the torrent of fraud and obscenity known politely as unsolicited bulk email and colloquially as spam. So again, in order to get to the real stuff, you have to wade through all of this unsolicited mail that you didn't want. And a perverse tribute to the power of the online revolution, we are all suddenly getting the same mail. Easy weight loss, get rich quick schemes, etc. So again, these are all things that we're familiar with. They're pointing out examples of spam in case we didn't know what it was. The crush of these messages is now numbered in the billions per day. It's becoming a major systems and engineering network problem, says one email expert. Spammers are gaining control of the internet. So if I was doing the PSAA, the purpose is simply explaining, right? They're telling us how in today's modern age, we're getting more and more spam, right? In terms of the structure, again, it presents this little vignette about what our own email inbox looks like and makes lots of appeals to different types of spam that we've all received in our lifetime. So that's the structure. In terms of the argument, again, there's not really an argument here other than the fact that this is a problem. Most of what it's doing is simply explaining that particular problem. And again, in terms of the attitude of the speaker, kind of almost joking in a sense, trying to appeal to that humor that we all find in those email messages that we get unsolicited that ask us to do all kinds of crazy things or ask us if we want products that we've never thought of before. All right, so that's passage one. Passage two, many people who hate spam assume that it is protected as free speech. Not necessarily so. The United States Supreme Court has previously ruled that individuals may preserve a threshold of privacy. So here we actually have an argument, right? Spam is not protected freedom of speech. So the Supreme Court has already ruled that we have a right to privacy that frees us from spam. So again, it's kind of arguing for this. Nothing in the Constitution compels us to listen to or to view any unwanted communication, whatever its merit, wrote Chief Justice Warren Burger in a 1970 decision. We therefore categorically reject the argument that a vendor has a right to send unwanted material into the home of another. So again, it gives us the wording of the Supreme Court decision saying that people have a right to be free from spam. With regard to a seemingly uh, similar problem, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991 made it illegal in the United States to send unsolicited faxes. Why not extend the act to include unsolicited bulk email? So again, at the very end, we have this appeal to something that they want us to do, perhaps to extend this already uh, unprotected free speech to something else. So in terms of the purpose, again, it's making an argument that spam is not free speech. It, in terms of its structure, it gives us examples of the Supreme Court decision and verbiage. And in the end, again, it makes this appeal to ask us to uh, consider expanding the Supreme Court's decision to include this other medium. All right, so let's look at the questions. Number six, the primary purpose of passage one is to make a comparison. No, there's nothing being compared. Dispute a hypothesis. No, there's nothing being disputed. Settle a controversy. Not doing that either. 
justify a distinction or to highlight a concern. All right, passage one was all about the spam in your email inbox, and that's exactly what it's doing, E, highlighting a concern, right? The primary purpose of passage two, so passage two is the constitution piece. So the primary purpose of passage two is to confirm a widely held belief. No, it's actually doing the opposite. Discuss the inadequacies of a ruling. Nope, not doing that. Defend the controversial technology. Nope. Analyze a widespread social problem, well, kind of, or lay the foundation for a course of action. Again, look at that rhetorical question at the end. Why not extend the act? That's its real purpose there. It's trying to get people to do this particular action. So the answer is E. Number eight, what would most likely be the reaction of the author of passage one, right? So passage one was the, there's spam everywhere, to passage two, Right, that says nothing in the Constitution compels us to view any unwanted communication. Right, so how would they react? One, surprise at the assumption that freedom of speech is indispensable. No. Dismay at the Supreme Court's vigorous defense of vendors' rights. This guy's saying exactly the opposite. Hope that the same reasoning would be applied to all unsolicited email. Yeah, that's a maybe. Concern for the plight of mass marketers. No, they keep saying no spam. Appreciation for the political complexity of the debate about spam. No, passage one guy was the no spam. So C, hope that the same reason would be applied to unsolicited email. Unlike the author of passage one, the author of passage two does what? Criticizes a practice. No, they both do that. Offers an example. They both do that. Proposes a solution. That's a maybe. States an opinion. No, they both do that. Quotes an expert. No, nope, they both do that. So our only option that we're left with is C with proposes a solution. Passage one guy says it's a problem. Passage two guy says, yes, it's a problem. And again, this would be a proposed solution. So although that was rather quick, you can kind of guess what questions they're going to ask. And if you practice the PSAA method, it's really going to have answers. Right? So again, the passage analysis, your real keys to acing it are remember those pieces of the acronym. What's the purpose? What's the structure? What's the argument? And again, the next piece that they give you is a section from prose. And so they tell you in the following passage, it's adapted from a novel set in the early 20th century. Mr. Beebe, a clergyman, is speaking with Cecil Weiss about a mutual acquaintance, Lucy Honeychurch. Miss Honeychurch has recently returned from a journey with her older cousin and her chaperone, Miss Bartlett. Lucy Honeychurch has no faults, said Cecil with grave sincerity. I quite agree. At present, she has none. At present? I'm not cynical. I'm only thinking of my pet theory about Miss Honeychurch. Does it seem reasonable that she should play piano so wonderfully and live so quietly? So again, here we have two people arguing about Lucy Honeychurch. Cecil is pretty adamant that she's perfect, right? Mr. Beebe, the clergyman, says, eh, she's perfect now, but there's an interesting duality to her character, right? She can play the piano so wonderfully, and again, playing the piano is something that re requires a great deal of passion, but yet she lives so quietly. So again, he's pointing to this, this duality of her character, that it seems strange to him that she can be so pure and good and yet play with such passion. I suspect that someday she shall be wonderful in both. The watertight compartments in her will break down and music and life will mingle. Then we shall have her heroically good, heroically bad, too heroic perhaps to be good or bad. So again, when that passion is finally unleashed, she might be a pretty bad girl, right? Which might actually be good, but again, it's going to get rid of that all good girl kind of image. Cecil found his companion interesting. And at present, you think her not wonderful as far as life goes? Well, I must say, I've only seen her at Tunbridge Wells where she was not wonderful and at Florence. She wasn't wonderful in Florence either, but I kept on expecting that she would be. In what way? Conversation had become agreeable to them and they were pacing up and down the terrace. So this is a friendly conversation. 
I could as easily tell you what tune she'll play next. There was simply the sense that she found wings and meant to use them. I can show you a beautiful picture in my diary. Miss Honeychurch as a kite, Miss Bartlett holding a string. Picture number two, the string breaks. So again, this is going back to that idea of unleashing the passion. She's not wonderful because again, he has this sense that she hasn't quite found her wings, right? She hasn't quite used or employed them. She hasn't let that passion free. So again, he imagines her and draws her as a kite. And then in the second picture, he imagines the kite string breaking, which would her uh, be her enveloping herself in that passion. The sketch was in his diary, but it had made afterwards when he viewed things artistically. At the time, he had given surreptitious tugs to the string himself. So again, he'd even kind of made overtures to her to try to get her to unleash that passion. But the string never broke. No, I mightn't have seen Miss Honeychurch rise, but I certainly should have heard Miss Bartlett fall. So again, she's never been able to free or liberate herself. It has broken now, said the young man in low, vibrating tones. So again, he says that kind of quietly. It has broken now. She's free. We're kind of left to wonder what that means. And then we get to immediately, he realized that of all the conceited, ludicrous, contemptible ways of an announcing an engagement, this was the worst. So now we come to the real crux of the passage. They've been talking about Miss Honeychurch just in theory. He's asked the minister or the clergyman what he thinks about her. The clergyman says that she's a little bit too restrained. And now we find out that they're actually talking about uh, Cecil's fiance that he has liberated her but he realizes that in using that metaphor that he's the liberator or he's freeing her or flying her kite that that's kind of a, a very arrogant or egotistical thing to say he cursed his love of metaphor had he suggested that he was a star and Lucy the kite was soaring up to reach him broken what do you mean I meant said Cecil stiffly that she is going to marry me. And again, this is one of those moments of dough in a conversation where the clergyman realizes that he's been talking about how, oh, she's going to someday, you know, that string is going to break and her passions are going to break free. And he realizes that he's spoken a little bit too freely um, and has really stuck his foot in his mouth proverbially. The clergyman was conscious of some bitter disappointment, which he could not keep out of his voice. I'm sorry. I must apologize. I had no idea that you were intimate with her. I should never talk in this flippant, superficial way. You ought to have stopped me. And down in the garden, he saw Lucy herself. Yes, he was disappointed. So again, he realizes that he shouldn't have talked this way. And he's also a little bit disappointed because he kind of hoped that he would be the one to tug on those strings or to free her from the bondage that's put in place by her chaperone. Cecil, who naturally preferred congratulations to apologies, drew down the corner of his mouth. Was this the reaction that he would get from the whole world? Of course, he despised the world as a whole, as every thoughtful man should. It is almost a test of refinement. I'm sorry I've given you a shock, he said dryly. I fear that Lucy's choice does not meet with your approval. So again, he's being kind of facetious and cynical here saying that obviously Mr. Uh, Beebe doesn't uh, agree with the selection that she has made, right? So looking at the questions, now that we've got our purpose, we're just talking about Miss Honeychurch in terms of the structure, right? We have two different opinions of her. One is that she's perfect. The other one is that eh, she needs to let loose a little bit. And then again, we've got the general theme here at the very end about Cecil announcing his engagement and the difficulties that it proposes because again, everyone thinks that she needs to let loose a little bit. So number 10, Cecil's remark in line one that Lucy has no faults, right, is made in the tone of which of the following? If you read carefully, he says this with sincerity, grave sincerity. And again, that means that he's very serious. So the only option that you have here is A, great conviction. A conviction is a strong belief. He's not being neutral. He's saying she's perfect. He's not being ironic. He says that she's perfect. He's not surprised, nor is he being cynical or sarcastic. He's being serious, saying that she has no faults. Okay. 
Number 11, Mr. Beebe asked the questions in lines six through seven, primarily in order to do which of the following. Does it seem reasonable that she should play the piano so wonderfully and live so quietly? So which of the following is he doing? If you've read carefully, one of the things that you'll notice here is that he's noting D, an apparent inconsistency, that she again plays the piano with such passion, but is quite controlled by her chaperone and quite restrained in her uh, life. So again, D, noting an, uh, an apparent inconsistency would be the only correct answer. He's not raising an urgent concern or anticipating an objection or challenging any kind of theory. He's just noting that there's an inconsistency with the passion needed to play good music and the life that she actually lives. Number 12, Mr. Beebe makes the statement about a watertight compartment. The watertight compartments in her will break down and music and life will mingle. Then we shall have her heroically good, heroically bad. So which of the following is being suggested by that? Again, the boundaries of her propriety and passion are going to break down. So that she'll become a famous and respected musician? No. Eventually play music in a less disciplined fashion? No. One day begin to live with great passion? Aha. Uh -huh. Soon regret an impetuous decision? Nope. Or someday marry a man who will be the cause of her undoing. The only thing that these watertight compartments breaking down is going to do, according to the passage, is C, show that someday she's going to live with great passion. If you are careful when you do your critical reading passages, the answer should kind of stand out to you, that there should only be one real answer to them. So again, that's the goal of reading carefully and reading slowly, that you can see exactly, even in a complex and convoluted passage like this, you can see what answer that they are certain. Okay? Some of the questions on the critical reading section are going to ask you about meaning in context. So it says in line 24, sense most nearly means which of the following. There was simply the sense that she found beautiful wings and meant to use them. And again, by this, it means E, impression, right? There was the impression that she had found wings and now only needed to use them. So you can check uh, the answers to the last ones, 14, 15, and 16. Um, their answers are provided in the back. But again, if you've been following along closely, you should be able to do these relatively quickly, right? Um, so let's just look at 16 and make sure we've got the sense of this. The question in 39 through 40, right? Um, this is the piece about he cursed his love of metaphor. Had he suggested that he was a star and Lucy was soaring up to reach him? Why is Cecil afraid? He is afraid that Mr. Beebe will delect, uh, detect a lack of originality? No. Consider him to be vain. Look at before. Immediately he realized of all the conceited, ludicrous, contemptible ways. And conceited is another word for be vain. He's not afraid about telling of an inappropriate remark. Um, Mr. Beebe is the one who's made the inappropriate remarks. Distrust him as a confidant. There's no source or sense of that. Or attempt to block his engagement. Uh, there's nothing really said about him blocking the engagement other than intimating a little bit that Mr. Beebe is jealous. But the purpose of that line in general is he's afraid that B, he will consider him to be vain. So again, that's how you do the critical reading sections. Take a moment to just look at 14 and 15 now, right? So for Mr. Beebe, picture number two means what? This is the one of the kite string breaking. For this one, you should have selected D, an anticipated outcome. He imagines that this is what is going to happen inevitably someday. So the answer is D, an anticipated outcome. Right? Uh, for 15, ultimately Cecil re uh, reveals that his mark, it has broken now, said the young man, in low vibrating tones. Right? 
Remember, this is coming right after Cecil and Mr. Beebe have had a conversation about a subject that's a little bit embarrassing now that he has to say, uh, yeah, well, I, I'm kind of liberating her. her I, I'm the one who's going to marry her. So again, his remark and the way that it's mumbled um, shows that it is C, embarrassingly, embarrassingly inept. Um, he again does not feel that this is the right way to phrase it, but he's in a sticky situation, and that's the best answer that he can come up with. So you should have chosen uh, C for that particular answer. Right? So here's another long passage. And again, when you do the long passage pieces, what you should do is to stop periodically, pause, and practice that PSAA method. Right? When you do this, again, don't get bogged down in the language. In this particular piece, they're going to talk about some issues in modern physics. And again, you might not necessarily understand electrons and quarks, but you'll be able to understand the passage in context. Don't get too bogged down in it, and just simply pause as you go through from piece to piece. All right, so let's do the first part, and then you can go ahead and pause this recording and go through on your own. Calling it a cover-up would be far too dramatic. But for more than half a century, even in the midst of some of the greatest scientific achievements in history, physicists have been quietly aware of a dark cloud looming on a distant horizon. All right? So again, it's not quite a cover-up, but there's definitely an issue that physics has to contend with, right? And it's ominous, like a dark cloud. The problem is this. There are two foundational pillars upon which modern physics rests. One is general relativity, which provides a theoretical framework for understanding the universe on the largest of scales, stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and beyond to the immense expanse of the universe itself. So again, general relativity governs big principles. The other is quantum mechanics, which provides a theoretical framework for understanding the universe on the smallest of scales molecules, atoms, and all the way down to subatomic particles like electrons and quarks. So we've got big picture understanding versus little picture understanding. And we can see why those two things might be in competition with each other. Through years of research, physicists have experimentally confirmed to almost unimaginable accuracy virtually all predictions made by each of these theories but the same theoretical tools inexorably lead to another disturbing conclusion. As they are currently formulated, general relativity and quantum mechanics cannot both be right. So this is their thesis. The big picture and little picture can't both be right. The two theories underlying the tremendous progress of physics during the last hundred years, progress that has explained the expansion of the heavens and the fundamental structure of matter, are mutually incompatible. So you have two different big picture, little picture, and these two things are incompatible. So again, science eventually is going to have to choose. So if we practice this PSAA method, you don't have to know about quarks. You don't have to know about some of these big words that they are giving you in physics. You simply have to understand that what is being presented here is a debate. Big picture, little picture. And those big picture versus little picture uh, uh, issues are going to fuel the rest of the paragraph here. Just from this very first piece, you can answer, right, questions 17, 18, and 19, right? What would the dark cloud be, right? Uh, for number 18, which pairing best represents the different models of the universe? obviously the big and little, right? And then again, which different ones would the author's use of italics emphasize? So as you go through the answers, you've already predicted some of the questions in your reading. Just continue to pause periodically and summarize. Don't get yourself caught up in the fact that you don't know anything about quantum mechanics. You don't have to. You simply have to be able to answer some of the questions that they give you. As you go through, right, practice the PSA method and answer those rest of the questions and see how many you get right. Using the PSAA method, you should improve the accuracy of your 
All right, the grammar and the then writing Then we get section. to the grammar and writing This section. is the section that and it's easiest the easiest to improve section, your score It can score be very hard Because you can so study. So write down and look there for There are patterns. certain patterns the better you that get they're at going it, to employ. The higher you're going and to score. And once you start right? learning Here those patterns to the general questions, questions and how regular those they're questions They're going to ask you about occur, subject verb agreement. You can begin to predict where the subject of the sentence doesn't match the verb. So I'm going to run through quickly some of those patterns to look for. They're going to ask you about the pronoun at the beginning doesn't match the pronoun at the end. And again, I would suggest that you make yourself a little Card with those They're going to ask and then as you go through the PSAT practice, you not only label what the so answer to the question to, is, but also uh, what kind of question it is. Running, All right, so here are the most biking. common ones. You can't enjoy Subject, running, verb, swimming, agreement. And to bike. We would you recognize that we is going to the store part, is so not correct. But balance sometimes each when you're in a hurry so or when the they're carefully camouflaged, you can miss subject verb agreement. The so always this find the subject of the sentence the and check it against the uh, verb to make sure that it agrees the in the case sentence and the number. Reduction. Again, don't the second be thing is pronoun agreement. We have to make sure that the pronouns that we're using better. agree Sometimes again in case and number. So while we being say in conversation not a uh, that someone in we left simp their book, so someone is singular, that which means someone answer. left his or You can her also see book. issues with comma splicing. Parallelism is again, another piece that they ask lots that it's of not questions about. Go, like not only parallelism of sentences. verbs, meaning they have to be the same, You'll also so see you could not say something like, I again, like rather than to using the right swim preposition to in English, run and be eating Twinkies. Else. It has so to again, be to swim, to run, and to eat Twinkies. So there has to be that parallelism. There also has to be parallelism of sentence parts. So, for and example, if uh, the sentence logic, says that again, John grew more vegetables, like or John's garden grew don't more vegetables than his neighbors, you're comparing vegetables that are to neighbors. Place, so that, that doesn't work. It would have modified. to be that John's garden and there's always grew a few random more vegetables like than his adverb, neighbor's I garden. And again, that kind sentence. of parallelism can um, be tricky when reading sentences. But again, if you sentences. know these basic patterns sentence and you start to identify them, it used to be a true, especially like in eighth grade, that the longest answer was always the correct one. And on the SAT and PSAT, that is not the case. They like to get you to reduce sentences, get rid of redundancies, and get rid of syntax that is garbled or hard to understand. So don't be afraid to shorten sentences. Comma splices are commas that are hanging out in the wrong place. They're commas that are where they're not supposed to go, such as in between two complete sentences. So you'll have to fix a comma splice, and oftentimes only one answer will correct that comma splice. Wrong prepositions. One of the things that the PSAT looks at is how fluent you are in the English language. So this is one for people who are English as a second language learners. Certain verbs can only take certain prepositions. And again, it's one of those things that you either know or you don't. And so again, to see whether people are completely fluent and know some of these subtle nuances, they'll ask the wrong prepositions or put the wrong prepositions in sentences. Uh, incorrect connections or logic, um, that's where you have the wrong connector word between sentences. Um, so if I said something like, um, Susie has hives and is allergic to something, uh, because she has the hives, obviously it's because she's allergic to something. And so to say that she has hives and she's allergic to something is the wrong connection to make there. So the logic is off. And then clauses that are improperly placed. The clause that modifies the noun needs to come close to that. And so oftentimes they'll make a sentence convoluted so that the clause is improperly placed and it's not modifying the right word. So these are just a few of them, and there are a couple of extra random ones that they'll throw in there. But if you can train yourself to look for these few pieces of, of incorrect sentences, then you'll be able to do much better on the grammar and writing section. Five of the uh, practice piece, um, question 15 says, storing bread in the refrigerator, which is your subject, delays drying and the growth of mold but increase the rate at which bread loses flavor. Storing bread delays drying, but increases the rate at which the bread loses flavor. So that's an example of subject verb. Pronoun agreement means that the pronouns don't necessarily match. So again, when you have a pronoun agreement, you have one that doesn't match the pronoun that follows. 
So examples of pronoun agreement that you might see um, occur in section five. Um, if you look at section five, um, number, if you look at section five, number 25, it says, in order for the audience to believe in and be engaged by Shakespearean character, they have to come across as a real person. A character is singular, so a character, he, has to come across as a real person. So again, that has to match in case and in case. When you look at sentence reduction, again, sentence reduction means that you take a sentence that doesn't necessarily uh, make sense and you shorten it to what needs to be cut out. So for question number 10 in section five, it says, when for the first time the United States imported more oil than it exported, Americans should have realized that an energy crisis was imminent and could happen in the future. Well, imminent and could happen in the future mean exactly the same thing. So your only option here is E might be imminent because again, it gets rid of that sentence redundant. Right? Comma splices is where you have commas that go in between two complete sentences. In section five, again, if you take a look at number seven, a poetic form congenial to Robert Browning was the dramatic monologue, comma. It let him explore a character's mind without the simplifications demanded by stage productions. The only option that you have here to fix that and to make that two independent clauses work together is B, monologue, which let him explore. Um, that's your only option to fix that comma splice, a comma that's in some place it's supposed to go. Right? Um, parallelism of subjects. Um, or parallelism of verbs and sentence parts is something that can be very tricky. Um, but again, what you're looking for is sentences that are equally balanced, and sometimes that can be very difficult. Um, take a look at section five, number 27. Lynn Margulis's theory that evolution is a process involving interdependency rather than competition among organisms differs dramatically from most biologists. Here, you're comparing her theory to biologist, and that's not what you're doing. You're comparing her theory to other biologists' theories. So that's why I said sometimes those sentence part pieces can be very tricky. But again, watch those parallel pieces because they have to match, right? Wrong prepositions. Um, using the wrong prepositions and words usually will jump out at a native English speaker. So if you look at section five, number 26, most of the hypotheses that Kepler developed to explain forces were later rejected as inconsistent to Newtonian theory. Um, the preposition is inconsistent with Newtonian theory. So your answer should be D for that one. Uh, inconsistent required, right? Um, and again, incorrect logic um, means that you have sentence pieces that are connected in some way that don't make sense. Um, so if you look at section five, number three, the landscape artist who designed New York City's Central Park believed that providing scenic settings accessible to all would not only benefit the public's physical and mental health and also foster a sense of democracy. That's the wrong connector there. The and doesn't work. So it should be but also foster a sense of democracy, which is D. And again, clauses improperly placed mean that you have something that's modifying a clause that's improperly put. So examples of that, um, if you take a look at uh, question number two in section five, to help freshmen and sophomores in selecting their courses, candid reviews of courses and instructors compiled by juniors and seniors. This is a problem because it's a sentence fragment, but if you also look at it, to help freshmen and sophomores, the subject of this is candid reviews. Well, candid reviews weren't helping freshmen and sophomores. It was the juniors and seniors, right, who compiled this that helped the freshmen and the sophomores. So you've got the wrong thing being modified. So if you look at this one, for example, working in the 19th century, the writings of Charles Dickens, the writings here seem to suggest that it's working in the 19th century. And again, it's not the writings working in the 19th century, but Charles Dickens. So you'd have to reverse this. Similarly, in question number two, you'd have to have the juniors and seniors have compiled 
candid reviews of courses and instructors write. Right. So as you go through and examine some of the sections, one of the ways that you can help yourself is by labeling the pieces and the parts. What kind of sentence problem do each one represent? Okay, so a few of these we have already done, but I'm just going to go through them and give you the opportunity to practice. What I would suggest that you do on your own to practice is not only to go through and find out which ones have no error, but also to write what type of sentence it is. What sentence problem type is it? So for example, number 12, America's first roller coaster ride, which opened in 1884 at Coney Island, Brooklyn, and capable of a top speed of only six miles per hour. This one is a sentence fragment and again, you have to change the and capable of to is capable of, so the answer there is B. So again, you've got a fragment piece here where you have to make the verb work in the sentence. In each section, you're generally only going to have about two or three no errors. It has happened before where there's four in a section, but generally if you have more than two or three, go back and take a look and see if perhaps you might have overlooked one of the small nitnoid sentence errors that they put in here. So number 13, the inflation rate in that country is so high that even with the adjusted wages, most workers can barely pay for food and shelter. The way that I approach a problem like this where I don't see anything that immediately pops out at me is I look at the subject, which in this sentence is the inflation rate. So the inflation rate is so high that, that's fine, even with, there's not a preposition issue, even with adjusted wages, most workers, that's correct, can barely pay for food and shelter. There's no problem with the adverb barely pay. All of that is correct. So then, and only then, would I mark E, no error, which is the answer. But again, always go through and check your subject, check your verb, check sentences that have prepositions underlined to make sure it's the correct preposition, and check again your adverbs, because again, occasionally they will ask that question. Over the past two years, apparel manufacturers have worked to meeting the fre uh, revised federal standards for the design of uniforms. That one's pretty easy and should stand out right away. You should choose C, again, to meet the revised federal standards is the correct answer. Number 15, we looked at storing bread as the subject. So storing bread delays drying and the growth of mold, but storing bread increases the rate at which bread loses flavor. So B should be the correct answer here. According to last week's survey, most voters were disappointed by legislators' inability working together on key issues. This should be another one that kind of jumps right out at you. Um, inability to work here, we need that uh, infinitive here, so inability to work, so C is the correct one. And again, if it doesn't immediately jump out at you, I always check out the piece here with the subject and the verb, so voters were, were what, disappointed by, the preposition is correct, legislators' inability, the inability of legislators, plural, that's correct, and then to work together on key issues, so C is the answer. Um, when Marie Curie shared the 1903 Nobel Prize for Physics with two other scientists, her husband Pierre Curie and Henri Pecquerel, she had been the first woman to win the prize. Again, our verb here, she shared, so she was the first woman to win the prize. So C should be the correct answer there. Uh, every spring in rural Vermont, the sound of sap dripping into galvanized metal buckets signal the beginning of the traditional season for gathering maple syrup. Again, every time I'm not sure or something doesn't stand out at me, we've got the sound, right? The sound signals the beginning of the traditional season. So C is incorrect, and this is a subject verb agreement one. Those investors who sold stocks just before the stock market crashed in 1929 were either wise or exceptional lucky. 
And again, this is one of those odd ones that they'll throw in from time to time. There's a problem here with the uh, adverb. They were not exceptional lucky, they were exceptionally lucky. So D is the answer here. So again, every time I go through an answer, I always check for subject verb agreement. I check for prepositions. I check for small little things like parallelism of uh, the, the parts of the sentence. All of those things will jump out at you if you start to go through your practice tests and label what kind of sentence errors they are. So most of the sediment and nutrients of the Mississippi River no longer reach the coastal wetlands and has adversely affected the region's ecological balance. So most of the sediment right, no longer reach the coastal wetlands. A phenomenon is singular that has adversely affected, affected with an A is the verb, an effect with an E is the noun the region's ecological balance. So the coastal wetland is a region, so that one should be E, no error. And again, you go through every sentence piece and sentence part to look for those problems. Most major air pollutants cannot be seen, although large amounts of them concentrated in cities are visible as smog. So most major air pollutants Right, that one is our subject, they cannot be seen, that's correct. Large amounts of them, them is the air pollutants, uh, large amounts of them concentrated in cities, that describes the air pollutants. Um, the large amounts are visible as smog. So again, that one is correct, that one is an E, no error sentence. This one is one of the tricky subject verb ones that we looked at before, the light. Right? The light emitted by high intensity discharge car headlights. This prepositional phrase by intensity uh, discharge car headlights is part of a prep phrase so we kind of uh, ignore that. The light emitted are very effective in activating the reflective paints of road markers thereby making driving at night safer. So again the light emitted is very effective. During the 19th century, Greek mythology acquired renewed significance when both poets and painters turned to the ancient myths for subject matter. And again, during the 19th century is correct. Greek mythology acquired is correct. Renewed significance when both poets and painters turned to, that's correct, preposition is right, for subject matter. And again, all of those prepositions are correct, so that one is an E, no error. 24, the muse museum is submitting proposals to several foundations in the hope to gain funds to build a tropical butterfly conservatory. You can see how this sentence has a syntactical error. The museum is submitting proposals is correct to several foundations, but it's this phrase, in the hope to gain funds. You do things in hopes of um, or in hopes of gaining. Um, you don't hope to gain, that's not the correct prepositional phrase here. So D would be your answer. 25, we looked at in order for the audience to believe and be engaged by a Shakespearean character, they have to come across as a real person. Character is singular, person is singular, they is plural, so C is the incorrect one. Most of the hypotheses that Kepler developed to explain physical forces were later rejected as inconsistent to Newtonian theory. This one again is one of those prepositions. Things are inconsistent not to, but inconsistent with. So that one is D. We also looked at 27 as an example of parallelism. Lynn Margulis's theory, right, differs dramatically from most biologists apostrophe theories. You have to compare her theory to their theories, not the theory to biologists. So that's a parallelism issue. Uh, the Empire State Building, Sears Tower, the Canadian National Tower, each, each is a singular pronoun, each of these structures was the tallest in the world at the time they were built. And again, if each is singular, each was at the time that it was built. So again, that's a pronoun issue. The cost of safely disposing of toxic chemicals is approximately five times what the company paid to purchase it. The it here refers to the toxic chemicals. So you have a problem again with pronouns. Top, toxic chemicals are plural, so what the company paid to purchase them. So D would be the correct. Right? 
The last section that you're going to have to contend with is the grammar passage. The grammar passage is very much like the earlier uh, comprehension passages and analytical passages, except they're not going to ask you the questions about what the purpose is or what the structure is. They're going to simply ask you to revise or rewrite parts of the sentences. They're going to ask you about how to best phrase things, but you do have to be careful and make sure you stop and summarize what the article is saying, because some of the sentence revisions will actually change the meaning of the article. So it will be grammatically correct but it will not convey the intentions of the article. So be very careful with those because again, they might be grammatically acceptable, but they are not acceptable in that they revise what the article itself is saying. Right? So here is an example of one of the grammar passages that they might give you. Right? So it says, on September 10th, 1973, the United States Postal Service issued a stamp honoring Henry Osawa Tanner, one of four stamps in the American Arts series. So again, I just stop and pause. So we're talking about issuing a stamp honoring this man. Acclaimed as an artist in the United States and in Europe at the turn of the century, Tanner was called the Dean of Art by W.E.B. Du Bois. But after his death, Tanner's work was largely forgotten. So again, he was a forgotten kind of artist, even though he inspired many. And so it remained, and even later, in 1969, the donation of one of his paintings to the Smithsonian Institution aroused new interest in the art of this American master. So again, interest in him was revitalized by this exhibition. Now his works are on exhibit again. You can even buy posters of his paintings. One of his most famous works is a realistic pan painting by the name of The Banjo Lesson. It was inspired by a poem of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So again, I pause. He inspired, this work was inspired by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who did Sympathy. The name is The Banjo Lesson. This is a famous work. The painting isn't like a photograph. The magnificent of his work can be seen with each subtle brushstroke, each carefully ca crafted detail. The effect is truly beautiful. If I were to try to identify the dominant theme of the painting, I would have to say that it is family cohesiveness because the entire scene seems to emphasize the bond between the boy and his grandfather. So ignore the fact that that's not a theme because it's a message. We're now going to look for some of the grammatical errors in this particular piece. So it says, which is the best version of the underlying part of the sentence, right? Acclaimed as an artist, Tanner was called the Dean of Art by W.E.B. Du Bois. So this is one of those clause pieces. Acclaimed as an artist, right? The next thing that follows has to be Tanner because Tanner is the one who's being acclaimed as an artist. So again, the only one that keeps it correct is A, as it is now. Right. Um, B creates a comma or a fragment in there. Uh, semicolons only go between two complete sentences. You can't have D because again, W. E. B. Du Bois is not the subject and the person who is acclaimed as the artist. So question thirty one, right? says, how would we best put this? And so it remained, and even later in 1969, the donation of one of his paintings to the Smithsonian aroused new interest in the art of this American master. So, and so it remained, and even later, right? And so it remained that he was forgotten until 1969 when, so again, D would be your best choice here. And 32, which is the best revision of this? You can even buy posters of his paintings, right? And again, the idea is that E, one can even buy posters of his paintings. Right? People ask why it's not D and what the difference is. People can even buy his paintings, plural, as a poster. People can buy his paintings as posters. That would have to match in grammatical case and number, and it doesn't. Okay? So that's an example of what to expect on that particular portion of the SAT and PSAT. Right? Then we get to the essay. And the essay on the SATs is always going to give you a this or this scenario. It doesn't matter which side you pick. Go with whatever can give you the most fodder for your paragraphs. You're going to have to have two examples in each one of the body paragraphs. And I suggest that you use a thesis that is bipartite, meaning two parts, because you do not have time for three. The best that you can hope for in the 25 minutes is to have an intro, two body paragraphs, and a conclusion. That's a very strong structure. 
It demonstrates your capability to organize your thoughts and to elaborate, and that's really what they're looking for. So the SAT's maximum, right? They're gonna ask you in 25 minutes to write a response to a question that is polarized. Is it this or this? And the prompt is then gonna ask you to qualify, explain, expand, or elaborate. In other words, they want you to write a thesis. So they don't want you to just write television unites people. You have to give reasons why or examples of this. So in two paragraphs, you're gonna address aspects of that particular issue. And then in the conclusion paragraph, what you're going to do is to address what the other side would say and then refute their argument. Show that you understand the other side, but that you don't agree and offer refute. So here's an example of what they're looking for with that prompt about does technology do divide or unite? So technology, although it can be divisive, and so again, I'm acknowledging the other side, actually unites people by providing educational opportunities and by communicating shared values. So in one paragraph, I'd have to write about the educational opportunities television affords. And that's easy. Think about Sesame Street or Dora the Explorer or any television show like the Discovery Channel's programming or the History Channel's programming that gives education. And the second part is gonna be communicating shared values. Again, think about news stories that communicate important values or important things to the community that helps them be more cohesive. So again, one paragraph is gonna be about educational uh, through television, and then the second one is gonna be about values. And then the final paragraph, what I'll do is provide counter arguments that would say that technology is actually divisive. So I'd give examples that perhaps people watch TV instead of sitting together at home at dinner, and I would refute that by saying by watching the programming together, they can actually spend quality time with one another. So that's what you do when you do the essay, is try to divide it into two different pieces that are going to support, right? They want specific examples. Stay away from movies. What they're looking for you is to provide something that shows that you have an exceptional knowledge base. So they want things like history and historical examples. You may use literary examples. They tell you that you can use personal examples, but stay away from the personal unless it is very specific and it's something that sets you apart from other people. So again, if they're talking about bullying in school, they don't wanna see a sentence like, I have witnessed bullying in school many times. That's not significant or important. They're looking for something that shows your aptitudes or abilities. So although they say personal examples, again, unless they are precise and specific, stay away from them. They're also going to give you a quotation to read. Don't use the quotation as the hook. Use something else to earn originality points. They will have seen that particular quote used and reused multiple times before they get to you. So again, when you're doing SAT practice, the best thing to do is to do just quick little drills, right? So take an issue and divide it into two parts, right? So they're always gonna ask you, is it this or is it this? And then you have to have two parts to back up why you believe it is that thing. So when you start your intro, you're always gonna start with a hook, like a definition or a, a vignette, a little story that illustrates something. Explain that in two or three sentences. Transition to the topic, which shows that you understand what the sides of the issue is, and then, or are, and then give the thesis. And the thesis should not just be a restatement, but you need to elaborate, qualify, illustrate, or explain. So again, they want those at least two parts. So that's what they're looking for in the action, right? So here's an example, right? Think carefully about the issue presented. Idealistic people, people who pursue great ideas, right, often have ambitious plans that are difficult or even impossible to carry out, right? So this is where they give you the fodder for thought. This is what you think about. What do you think about idealistic people? Then they actually give you the question underneath it. Is an idealistic approach less valuable than a practical approach? So is it better to be an idealist or a realist, right? You've got to come up with a way to support that in two parts. So I could do like inventors and explorers and explain why idealism is good, or I could use two particular historical examples. Any of those would work. They're simply looking for you to craft. So here's a good example of an intro paragraph that would go along with that, right? 
I have a dream, said Martin Luther King Jr., addressing a large crowd in D.C. during the Civil Rights Movement. He was applauded for being idealistic, as it is a trait people admire in others. Specifically, King's idealism was praised by his audience as he inspired them to consider a better future, one filled with equal opportunity. So there's my hook, there's my explanation of it. Now I've got to situate the topic. Some might contend it's better to be practical. However, this is not the case as dreaming is important and is a source of inspiration to all people. Now I've got my thesis. The importance of being an idealist is evident in advice to children to follow their dreams, as well as in the historical example of JFK's Camelot. Right? So there's my thesis, and I'll have to give two examples in each one of the graphs that I've set up. Right? Here's another example that you can read on your own. Right? And again, this one has the thesis, idealists right, are actually beneficial because it encourages people to transcend the, listen of the limits of the possible. So again, think about inventors and scientists and affords people the possibility of creating social change. So I'd have to think about people who change the world with their idealism, MLK, Gandhi, John Lennon, uh, other political theorists. All of those would be examples in my paragraphs, right? So again, here's another example. Again, same idea, thesis, right? Um, this is important because it encourages invention and perseverance and reminds individual of a power to make a difference in the world. So again, I'm gonna talk about how idealism encourages different inventions and then people who've made a difference in the world. Those are all variations creating that two-part thesis where you can give solid examples in the body, right? So again, that's exactly what they're looking for as you craft that introduction, right? So again, I've given you lots of examples of sample thesis, and now you know exactly what goes in your paragraphs because in your body, you have to give two examples explaining that idea, right? And again, those examples can be taken from literature, they can be taken from your own personal life if they're significant, or history. Remember, keep in mind as you write the essay, you're trying to demonstrate your proficiency and honestly that you're better than your peers. So think about the things that you know that would mark you as especially erudite, sophisticated. Right? Here's another example you could use two people if you can't think. Right, of anything else. So again, Bill Gates and Sam Walton, and then use two experiences and how they typify this idea that is good. Okay. So here's another example. Is conscience more powerful than fame, money, or power? So you're either going to say that yes it is, or no it isn't. You really don't have time to address both. And then think of where it's shown that money is more powerful a motivator or that conscience is more powerful a motivator. Maybe you want to look at a scandal and in uh, an example from literature. So think about how you might break those particular pieces down. Right? As you write your essay, keep in mind that you want to give specific and precise examples. You also want to address the deeper aspects of the question. What are they really asking you about? Right? So again, if they're asking you about something like does, natural, uh, does a natural disaster divide people or unite them, they're really asking you a question about human nature. When they ask you about being idealist or practical, they're asking you again about what are the ramifications for human beings. Right? Are we dreamers? Are we unrealistic? Or are we definitely more grounded and practical? What is it saying about human nature? And if you can link it to the big picture, especially in the conclusion after you address those counter arguments, you will earn major points. So again, you'll have two readers for your essay. Each of them is going to grade it on a scale of one to six, six being the best. So your total max score is 12. Uh, a nine or 10 is a very good score, one that you should be proud of. And again, if you can get it to that point, um, again, that will earn you a good, solid writing score. So when you read your scores, when you get them back, if you're taking the PSAT, the PSAT doesn't have a writing section. Um, it has the multiple choice, but not the essay. So it's hard to really get a good fix on where you're standing. But for the other points on the PSAT, for the other parts, for the verbal and the math section, it's out of 80. Um, again, an 800 is a perfect score in a section. So if you add up your verbal and your math score, 
adding a zero to the end of the final numbers, that gives you an idea of where you sit. So again, a basic entrance score for UVA, William & Mary, JMU, or Virginia Tech was about 1,200. Now, uh, when a perfect score is out of three sections that are 800 points apiece, again, with that 2,400 being perfect, they're looking for you to get around a 2,100 as a very, very solid score, very respectable. So again, these are all different things that you can think about as you're preparing to take these various kinds of tests. I hope that I've helped you with some of the sections, some kind of tips and guidelines to follow as you're taking these tests. They're not the end-all, be-all of existence. If you don't score well on these tests, it doesn't mean that you'll never get into the college of your dreams. But again, a good solid score is definitely a start. So again, hopefully these were helpful in assisting you in preparing for the SAT or PSAT test.